So it's my uh, uh, very distinct pleasure and privilege, in fact, to welcome Professor uh, uh, John Chaffee, uh, uh, who I've known for uh, uh, at least two decades now, if not more. Uh, uh, and uh, John is someone who uh, I have tried to, you know, uh, emulate in many ways uh, with regards to, you know, I've looked up to uh, his, uh, you know, as a, as a teacher, wonderful set of notes, research papers were just great and, uh, uh, you know, I really tried to uh, follow his uh, footsteps and uh, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome John here and uh, you know, he has won uh, many, many awards, two, you know, countless to count, so I won't repeat all of them, but, uh, uh, you know, a few of them being the uh, Marconi, he won the Marconi Award, uh, winner of the uh, Bell Medal, uh, uh, and uh, a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and numerous other honors, uh, and uh, is founder and uh, CEO of ASIA. Uh, welcome, John. Uh, and by the way, one more thing, John's, one of John's uh, bosses is here, Professor uh, Paul Siegel, to listen to him, too. <laughs> Thank you. I'll note I have some former students here. Uh, thanks for coming as well, so bosses and students. So thank you for the kind uh, introduction and uh, happy to be here today. And my, you know, kind of tongue in cheek here with my title, right? Uh, the first couple of letters of the word five, you spell out as F-I, right? F-I-V-E. So why 5G? A um, little bit of a provocative thing about which is it going to be or combinations as we go forward in the future uh, in communications. So that's really the subject of the talk and I'll, I'll try to um, see if I can't provoke uh, some uh, interest and uh, response on that. So I'll start a little bit with some background just in the access area, talk about something that I think is very important in communications dimensionality, um, uh, then uh, talk about uh, some uh, basic measures of internet uh, access connection stability, and then get into really some math, but then kind of come back and try to pull, pull that all together into maybe a direction. Um, so um, first off, let's just look at high-speed uh, internet uh, connections. Uh, I'm sorry that's a little blurry. I I'm not sure. The original slides on my laptop look, look pretty clean. Can you all read that, or is that hard to, to see? Well, yeah, the, the, well, that's a font problem, uh, but uh, sorry for the quality. I'm not quite sure. Is any, anyone an expert and know how to fix that, or am I doing something wrong here? Uh, sure. Better? Yeah, a little bit better. Is that any better? No, not so much. Let me try one more thing. I'm sorry, sir. Tricky? Oh, that was all tricky. Oh, that's why. Okay. There we go. I'm sorry. So the mouse is just yeah, it's stuck. Uh, I just need to click on those things, but I can't actually which, move the mouse. Which one do you need to click on? So your mouse and is I just like stuck in one place. Yeah, it's. Uh, Wow, that won't go over there. Okay, which, yeah, this won't go over either. Yeah. That's probably, can, can well, we can use like take that uh, out of there. Okay. That should allow you to go over. There we go. Let's see if I can.
sure there's anything else we can do. We're going to have to add to our communications problems to solve the HDMI Mac interface here. So I apologize for that, but we'll try to go through uh, uh, nonetheless. Um, do uh, so, so the first question is, you know, as a user of the Internet, it doesn't really – we tend to not necessarily think of what our, our speed is as we're connecting. It's rather whether we're getting what we want to work uh, or not. Um, and that – tends to determine um, the quality of experience that the consumer is having. And if it's poor, uh, not good, and, and often I think we probably, if I, I ask this question, I always have, have some people put up two hands when I say, anyone have a problem connecting to the Internet in the last week, especially with your smartphone or other things? And of course, everyone does still have those, those problems, so a long way to go um, on that. And the trend in 5G is so-called convergence, where the, the consumer of the Internet data, whatever type or application, doesn't really know or care what their connection is. They're all supposed to look the same uh, in terms of connectivity. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about consumer uh, happiness and uh, use of the, the Internet. Um, this is something that, that uh, I found a couple of years ago. Uh, 75% of the daily viewers of over-the-top video get what's called buffer rage. Well, what's buffer rage? Well, here's the definition. Um, it's an, a state of uncontrollable fury or violent anger induced by the delayed or interrupted enjoyment of streaming, according to uh, email quest who provided this. And uh, two-thirds of uh, the respondents said they became frustrated. Uh, one in five <coughs> said they experienced severe uh, levels of frustration. So um, we, we, we don't have this yet if three-quarters of the users are seeing this every day. Um, now let's look at some of the, the access network um, uh, possibilities to deliver Internet to us. We start with the core network, of course, where we have the big routers and we're providing the connectivity to the various peering points uh, for the application servers that we all uh, try to use. There's an edge network where we'll see um, smaller <coughs> routers uh, at the edge, uh, content distribution networks and so forth uh, coming together. And then there's the access network. So maybe some form of copper like twisted pair or, or coax. It could be fiber. could be wireless, uh, all connecting to some uh, point closer uh, to us. And usually at the end, these days, almost everything is offloaded at that point to Wi-Fi. We can still have some Ethernet direct connections maybe to some of our devices. But this is our, our network, and it's increasingly likely uh, to experience problems as the signals get closer to the home. Now, you'll, you'll hear some people, the CDN people, if you, uh, to, to, to hear some of those say, well, the real problems are congestions in the network, uh, and, the, and Akamai, for instance, has data to show that. But the data that I've seen uh, on this from my own experience, my own company, uh, tend to indicate that, that increasing the uh, difficult connection the closer you yeah, get. I'm sorry, so a, is it okay to interrupt? Please? Yeah, sure. So quick question. Uh, is there like a quantitative definition of uh, stability? Um, like? Yes. There, well, it's, it's not the same for each operator and each application, but it's, it's usually it's some kind of combination, typically a linear combination of things like packet error rates, signal-to-noise ratios, uh, the number of disruptions or, or connection drops and other measures of physical layer uh, connectivity. And you have very little disruption or everything's good, you'll get a very stable rating. And then if you have uh, many of those things wrong, you'll have a very unstable uh, rating. So um, um, one, of the, one of the areas to, to look at, and I, I focus on twi Twisted Pair because I happen to know that area, worked a lot in it, um, fiber is getting closer and closer in the network. Typically to run a fiber to someone's home in any country in the world is an average of about $3,000 a connection. I know you'll see numbers that are less than that, but that's been one of the reasons we still see over a half a billion twisted pair copper connections, another 200 million, um, 250 million cable connections, and only a small number beyond that of actually fiber all the way to the home on a worldwide basis. But fiber does get closer and closer. 
Um, and the speed goes up as the copper uh, gets, gets close. So I tried to indicate that here. And these are really the mechanisms for connecting either the wireless uh, cell site or access point, as the case may be, or, or to the home. And you can see speeds now getting in, if you get down to a few hundred meters or less, into the gigabit per second range. There have been some techniques. Uh, originally, I thought I'd talk about them to here today. I'm not I'm talking about the Wi-5G. Uh, of uh, coming back and using the waveguide <coughs> modes, which have never been used before, in twisted pairs, which would lift uh, those speeds, and even uh, for Ethernet with twisted pairs by about a factor of 100 or more in terms of speed. Some people are beginning to measure that um, at, at this point in time, and so it looks like there's a lot of life uh, in, the, uh, in the copper plant. Um, and these are all per wire speeds, and it's one of the reasons I put the, the twisted pair here, because the coaxial speeds are, are shared, of course, of course, often hundreds uh, of users. So uh, in terms of peak speed, uh, they may be similar, but in terms of average speed, uh, much less. And this is a nice slide that um, Wen Tong, who's the CTO of Huawei, uh, presented, actually presented at Stanford a couple of weeks ago, um, beyond 5G. So we have this maybe getting faster and faster speeds on the connections to the wireless points. The focus here is going to be on wireless in this talk. Uh, this is a diagram you may have seen uh, for 5G, the little triangle, and it basically has one gigabits up at the top. That's the enhanced mobile broadband to try to get speeds uh, to those level. Over on the uh, bottom left-hand corner of the triangle, uh, one million users per square kilometer. And then the ultra reliable low latency, one millisecond, and they try to put all of these these requirements together uh, to meet 5G. Now, the in fact, the Huawei people don't like calling it 6G because it has kind of a bad connotation. So not yet called uh, 6G, maybe never called 6G. They took that diagram and said in the year 2030, so roughly 10 years ahead, uh, the speed goes up a thousand to one terabit per second. The uh, Latency goes down a factor of 10.1 milliseconds, and the uh, number of users goes up by a factor of 10 uh, per unit area uh, as well. So if you look at that, you say, well, what, what kind of bandwidths would they need? And I found this, this fairly interesting from the, uh, the Huawei 2030 vision. They're essentially saying that um, uh, we're going to, to start communicating using 3D mappings, holograms, lots of cameras around and taking pictures, sending that, that basically 3D image somewhere else, and then from that, uh, things are inferred or deducted, um, uh, and we can represent just about anything uh, that way. And examples, obviously, self-driving cars could make use of a capability like that, virtual mall uh, shopping, um, these light field uh, cameras, they try to give you 3D in, uh, images, entertainment, uh, you know, AR, VR, so forth. Um, industrial automation, it's kind of interesting getting into the factory and everything that's going on and bringing that back to some central place. What kind of data rates do they need for that? And so a four inch by four inch tile of, of space needs uncompressed about 30 <coughs> gigabits per second to transmit. If you compress it at 100 to 1, it's maybe 40, it should be 30 uh, megabits per second there, obviously at 100 uh, to 1, um, just a math error on the slide, but you get the idea. Uh, a human, so for diagnosing a person or analyzing a person and their whole body, whether it's their gait or their, their face or their image or their shape, um, five terabits per second uh, to cover that. Uh, if you compressed it, maybe 50, um, uh, 50, it should be 50 gigabits per second again. Sorry for the typo there. So more on these higher speeds later. Um, here's been the evolution of 5G, um, going back to 2015 and projecting to 2025. The vertical axis here on the left is basically the number of uh, mobile subscribers around the world getting up there to seven or eight billion uh, present day. And you can see the different generations of technology uh, coming uh, into play. And uh, the interesting thing here that I, I added these uh, on this plot from Ericsson, I added this 2G narrowband, and it was a relatively narrowband system, maybe about 270, uh, 280 kilohertz wide um, for the transmitted signals. 3G, of course, we're here at Qualcomm, and Qualcomm is the promoter of wideband, whether it was CDMA or some other form of wideband. 
um, that made an improvement, uh, made it more robust uh, for transmission. Uh, 4G went to even wider bands than 3G, um, switched over to a orthogonal frequency division multiplexer, but ne nevertheless wide band, and started to add more antennas, more dimensions, more dimensionality being used in the systems. 5G goes even further, very wide band and even more uh, antennas, so creating more paths between the source and the, and the user to get the speeds up. Um, here's a chart from the Cisco uh, Exhibit Report. They update this about once a year. Gives you an idea of not only that, that the amount of data being used on a worldwide basis is going up uh, fairly rapidly, but it breaks it down into uh, mobile traffic, which is the gray box up at the top, and then the other three uh, categories which are basically all Wi-Fi. And one of the interesting things there is basically that's about 80% of the data uh, today that's actually being uh, uh, sent over the internet is, 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 is going not on LTE, but actually on, on Wi-Fi. Um, here's the Wi-Fi. This is one of the diagrams that people use to describe Wi-Fi. The uh, versions of Wi-Fi at the uh, that are down in the very low frequency range, AH as it's called, AF, um, are, um, are lower data rates. They go further, and then we can go through the various standards all the way up to the AD or, or AY standards, the so-called Y gig, which are up in the millimeter wave, uh, 60 gigahertz uh, band. So it kind of covers a space, uh, depending on which standard you're using, of different speeds and different coverage. Uh, and then we have, um, on top of this, the whole concept of Internet of Things here, showing the number of devices uh, going to, in the not-too-distant future, to 25, 30 billion uh, devices, kind of a breakdown of the different technologies uh, uh, there. And, <coughs> and it, according to this Ericsson report from this year, only 1.5 billion of those 20 billion or so uh, will be served by cellular. And many of those are going to be within the range of some Wi-Fi access point. So interesting data. You see the case I'm making that Wi-Fi is kind of uh, more proliferated. Uh, for obvious reasons, we kind of view it as free. It may not be completely free, but it's unlicensed spectrum. Uh, and it give, makes us think that way. Now, there's another trend that's been going on over the last... One thing, John, in the yeah. previous month, the narrow band IoT, number short band IoT, Yes. It's nearly two times uh, bigger than the mobile phones by 2022. And, you know, given that we are not too far away from 2022, I would tend to view that that's some degree of skepticism. But that's just a, you know, it seems no. like, you know. I, I just took it from the Erickson no, report. So the sometimes the reports are, uh, the, best, the best of projections are sometimes not correct uh, going forward. Um, so, uh, now I'd like to kind of pick on the, the older type of communications. Even, even today we see with, with what's called software-defined networks which are beginning to, to take place, comes kind of centralized control uh, a plane that's separated from a data plane. Uh, but the centralized control is important, uh, and you tend to see that in networks that are run by big carriers uh, around the world. And if we compare that to the Internet, here my simplified version, uh, of it here. Basically, it's a bunch of, of routers. They have uh, both data plane connections to one another, and then they share routing tables among them, and they try to find the best path for the network. Uh, if you look at Wikipedia, this is uh, part of the diagram they show there is the <laughs> worldwide uh, internet, which is kind of just this mess. Almost looks like inside someone's brain, right, uh, with uh, networks uh, connecting. So no real central control. Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, the central type of control systems are large telcos, incumbents. They tend to own their own spectrum, which is the data plane, and they uh, manage their infrastructure to try to avoid conflict. And a sing single entity really uh, controls. In the distributed case, um, it uses the infrastructure, doesn't necessarily own it. Uh, control is local. Real control is really in the endpoints with the users in terms of the applications uh, that they're using. And an example I like to give on this is uh, in the year 2000, maybe a little bit earlier than that, going back to 1995, 
some of you who are maybe old enough to remember, my, there was a huge fight uh, between ATM and Ethernet IP. And ATM is this beautiful design. Alcatel was the original company who pioneered that. In, in Europe, um, it was packet switching, very centrally uh, controlled, um, very efficient in many ways. And then there was Ethernet, which was this thing that had just grown through the IEEE 802 committees over the years and gone to higher and higher speeds. And of course, we had the TCP IP protocol uh, come along that allowed the routing. Uh, and a lot of inefficiencies, in fact, even the original Bob Metcalf who did e Ethernet at one point had to eat his words because he said, this will never work at scale, and yet it continued to, to grow and grow and grow. Um, not nearly as well designed, but it won in the end because it put the control in the hands of the users. It, it, it actually enabled everyone to participate as opposed to a centralized group um, who defined everything. So. I'm suggesting in 2020, we may see a similar, now it's not exactly the same thing, but that LTE is very centrally controlled, okay? The carrier owns the spectrum, they allocate it to little resource blocks that they allocate to each uh, user according to a schedule that they define, versus Wi-Fi, which is this mess. It's a collision protocol, everybody shoots and if they collide, they try again in a random uh, time period later. But, on the other hand, it's 80% of the traffic today. It's not nearly as efficient as LTE. I, I, I could st spend a whole hour telling you about all the mistakes they made in the Wi-Fi standards over the years in, in terms of driving forward to new versions, but here it is widely used. So what I'm suggesting is that Wi-Fi may begin to push licensed efforts, maybe joined by other t forms of transmission like Bluetooth uh, and other things that are in unlicensed bands. Um, all of these systems fed by increasing bandwidth of copper fiber. And can a distributed control type of system actually work? So that's, that's the question I raise here in this talk. It certainly would empower applications and innovation, although might not be um, the first preference of the large incumbent uh, service providers who would like to control more of that for obvious financial uh, reasons. That's gonna create a mass for protocol use, especially at the physical layer. Uh, so let me talk a little bit more about dimensionality here, next subject. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example here. This is a, a, a transmission uh, a transfer function, if you will. It's frequency on the horizontal axis and amplitude. And you can see these notches in the band here. It's about 20 megahertz wide, and it corresponds to a 200 nanosecond delay, which is not that, uh, uh, that's pretty typical uh, for a lot of situations. And if you look at 2G, um, is about 300, I said 270, 280, I just made it 300 here. And I put that on, on the screen there, so well, if that transmission had to be in one of those notches, there's no signal, right? So nothing's gonna save that. Went to 3G, um, the, the spread spectrum systems uh, pioneered by Qualcomm, were about 1.2 megahertz wide, and it was a little harder to really knock out most of that with your typical uh, system, so the spread spectrum gave you more robustness. And then 4G went to 20 megahertz uh, wide um, uh, in many cases. Uh, Wi-Fi is also 20 megahertz channels. Uh, there are some smaller channels, but they're between 5, 10, 20, and they go to larger uh, numbers in, in 4G. And you can see that they, there's a good chance you're going to have a lot of the good parts getting through. And of course, if you code that system, then you can recover from what's lost. And in fact, LTE has these things called resource blocks, and the horizontal axis here is time, and the vertical axis is is <coughs> frequency, and they're grouped in terms of 12 adjacent frequencies in seven adjacent slots, and those get assigned to different users in the system. Very nicely done so that no one is using the same frequency at the same time in the LTE system. So that's frequency time dimensionality. We also see more and more antennas. Uh, and basically, three-dimensional space can be carved up so that at each point in space, we may have time, we have frequency, but it can be different from other points in space, especially in a, it's hard to see there, but land over two, if the wavelength uh, that we're using, if the antennas are spaced by a half a wavelength or more, 
they tend to be independent, especially if you have a rich environment where there's a lot of scattering going on in the atmosphere and in the environment. So time-space, uh, we have that. Now there are even more dimensions that we're not using yet. You may, or, may have heard about on, uh, orbital angular momentum, which is kind of a quantum physics level thing, I understand for some of the people who are running. This is real, these are new dimensions that you can communicate on even beyond uh, those that are used uh, today. Uh, but you get the basic point here. Uh, that we're increasingly using more and more dimensions. And as the frequencies go up, the wavelengths get smaller, and we have an opportunity to carve up space uh, with those smaller um, wavelengths uh, to create lots and lots of dimensions. So um, now, the time frequency systems that are in use today are basically multi-carrier systems. They use IFFTs and FFTs, transmitter and receiver. Uh, they may have applied codes across all of the used frequencies to provide redundancy against those frequencies who will be lost in those fades we saw earlier. And the basic idea here is frequency and time. Um, now, LTE uses tones that are 15 kilohertz wide. They combined uh, 12 of them. Uh, together in a minimum size block, so it's 180 kilohertz. Wi-Fi today, the best Wi-Fi systems will actually do about uh, a tone, uh, a block of tones is about 78.125 uh, kil. The, the tones are that wide, and they're about two megahertz on the resource blocks that are actually starting to be um, be used in the newest Wi-Fi standard. Okay, so we carve up. Frequency time. Now let's go back to Wi-Fi a second here. It's a collision protocol. So two different users can transmit. And if they happen to transmit at the same time, for some reason one didn't see the other and sensing uh, that, then there's a collision. And they have to wait a, a random period of time uh, before they try to transmit. Again, obviously that's inefficient. You've lost the transmission on both of the users for that period of time where you have to retransmit. Uh, and this corresponds to, in the uplink direction, different devices. It may be trying to communicate to some central thing like an, uh, an access point. Uh, and it can be between different access points. If you open up your phone these days, you start trying to find a Wi-Fi, you probably see 30 uh, um, uh, SSSIDs uh, in, in that uh, you have to select from. But they're all using the same frequency bands, roughly. So uh, uh, LTE avoided that. Wi-Fi didn't. Um, and it can cause uh, some kinds of, uh, of dimensionality uh, issues. Now, what we're beginning to see in Wi-Fi in the latest standard that came out really just very recently is that you can begin to start to assign these things as opposed to just allowing them to collide back off and try again. In fact, they call this coloring. And what it means is there's different patterns. Now, these can correspond to space, time, and frequency. In different, for different access points that are close to one another. And there's actually a little way where they can tell each other what they're doing. Okay, That's in the latest standards. Now, whether that's being used yet or not is another question, but it's beginning to become available. So you can see this concept of distributed, um, uh, coordinated um, uh, version, uh, similar to what we talked about with the routers earlier. So different access points can use different colors. And this can be determined in a distributed manner. And uh, my point is they're similar to the routing tables that we saw on the internet earlier. And they provide guidance on how and where to send. And they can be signaled at least between access points that can see one another uh, in a close uh, geographical uh, proximity. Uh, unfortunately, no single ent entity may control all the APs. Um, so, uh, especially if that's in residential use. So we're not talking about Cisco's Meraki systems or, or uh, Ruckus Wireless or some of those companies. They control an entire campus. They have all the, the routers under their control. We're talking about real life where we're out there outside of the working environment where there's all kinds of systems. Now when you have all these dimensions, there's basically different energy information that can be assigned. This is one of my favorite slides here is just how you adapt to a channel. Uh, what the energy pattern should look like. Um, this goes all the way back to Claude Shannon's 1948 paper. You'll see something called water filling uh, inside that paper. And basically, it's kind of like the inverse of Robin Hood. Energy goes where the, uh, the system is best. So the rich get richer and the poor get poorer uh, in, the, uh, 
water filling allocation. It's often called a loading problem, various areas of communications, how much energy and information should you put on the different dimensions. And water filling, if you have the signal to noise ratio versus an index, uh, could be frequency, could be another index, you turn it upside down, and you basically you pour energy in from the top and it'll lie to a flat uh, level as water would, and that turns out to be the optimum solution uh, for energy. Um, now as we add antennas, there can be signal going from each transmit antenna to each receive antenna, and so we get a matrix H that defines the channel. Uh, and if the antennas are spaced by a half a wavelength or more, um, you will start to see uh, the possibility for independent paths. So you've got this output equals some matrix H times input channel. And it turns out if you want to decompose it just like we're doing in frequency, it's kind of well known, it's called vector coding. Uh, you do the singular value decomposition of the channel matrix H, and basically the matrices that you get from singular value decomposition will tell you uh, what to do in this situation. And there's one of these done in monitored systems for every single tone or every single frequency uh, in the system. So this is the optimum transmission system. If you have that H and you take the two orthogonal matrices, one goes in the transmitter, the other goes in the receiver, and that will create a set of parallel independent channels or dimensions. And they each have their own gain, which correspond to the singular values. Zero channels you won't be able to use. Those that have significant gain you will be able to use in the transmission systems. Okay, This is really a single user uh, type system because the implication you're doing a matrix multiply in a transmitter and receiver means all the antennas got to be in the same place so that you can actually do that. So it's really a single user problem. That started in 802.11n in Wi-Fi and also around Rev10 uh, of LTE where there were more than one antenna allowed to be used. Um, and there is one of these optimum systems that's used on each tone or each frequency, if you will. And uh, again, the point that they all have to be in the same place. And this can increase the bandwidth by up to L times, where L is the minimum of the number of transmit antennas and the number of received uh, antennas. And quite often that will happen. You'll get close to that factor. Now we go one step further, and we have multi-user MIMO or mu MIMO. Okay? Here's a nice diagram of that, and the idea is to use many antennas to try to direct beams at each one of the users. Now the users are not all in the same place, so that singular value decomposition thing doesn't, doesn't really work anymore. Uh, but you can do what's called QR factorization or RQ fa factorization into a triangular and orthogonal matrix, and guess what, those, those tell you the, the optimum things to do. You do the factorization in different order. Uh, in terms of where the triangular matrix goes uh, for downlink and uplink, but it gives you the optimum uh, separation and you'll get um, a set of parallel uh, channels. They won't be quite as good as the, the case of singular value, but it is the best thing uh, that you can do in this particular situation. And the best use of energy and, and, uh, and data rate assigned to the different dimensions is rarely a water fill. It's a more complicated problem that you have to solve uh, to do that, but there are solutions known on how to do this. And here, for instance, if you do the RQ, I'm looking at the um, downlink problem. Uh, if you do that, the Q matrix tells you what a linear precoder is, and then there's a nonlinear precoder that precedes that that's determined by the R matrix. And you follow this structure, this gamma there is basically a modulo operation, uh, confines energy uh, to a certain region and you will get a set of parallel channels to each of the users and the gains will be the diagonals from the R matrix. You do that. Um, so it's one of these systems that's used on each tone again and again it can increase the bandwidth up to L times but it's not as good as the full MIMO and there's a dual of, of this system for uplink uh, where the nonlinear precoder basically is at the, the other end of the system uh, and is, is basically a decision feedback or successive approximation type structure. Okay, so nonlinear precoders, however, are not used in Wi-Fi nor LTE yet. And there's often, this is one of the mistakes, and actually the LTE guides did a better job in designing the system, but it's one of the biggest mistakes I've seen in wireless is this thing called multi-user diversity. It's a nice concept. In fact, it, it, she's like my little sister at, at Stanford. Andrea Goldsmith came up with this, this so I'm not knocking her, but the, the theory suggests uh, that a linear precoder is sufficient 
in wireless, but it's based on certain ergodic assumptions that's correct, the math's all correct, but that just doesn't happen in wireless. I'm not even close to happening in either Wi-Fi or LTE. And so the uh, gain can e easily be two to three times the data rate if you use these, these devices uh, uh, properly. So this is an area, kind of interesting, and if you've seen something called non-orthogonal multiple axis, basically these systems are equivalent to, to these nonlinear uh, methods starting uh, to be used. Now, if you happen to have a very large number of devices, but they're stationary, they're not moving around, and that's one of the things in this multi-user diversity. They assume that these devices are all changing positions at different points in times, and they kind of randomly wind up in a uniform di distribution everywhere. That doesn't happen in real life. The sensors are all fixed. They're all in given positions. Uh, but when you have that, uh, these nonlinear precoders are going to provide uh, an even, uh, uh, even better uh, gain uh, for the system. So basically what happens today is you see frequency, space, and time being carved and different users being assigned to different slots, maybe simply this way, a little more complicated that way, um, but that corresponds to the linear solution I just talked about. It is not the right thing uh, for the nonlinear systems. And you will actually see users sharing the same dimensions in the nonlinear approaches. So it's good, but not um, optimal. And there's going to be a trade-off between the different users as you get into the, um, the optimum designs as well. And you'll see many users optimally uh, and simultaneously uh, occupying the same dimensions. And the nonlinear uh, non processing allows you to separate them. So today, let's, let's just take a step back and say, what, what do we have? Well, Wi-Fi up to eight antennas. The 11N standard is a full MIMO, so it's a single user. Uh, in effect, our single spatial stream. The 802.11ac allows uh, for up to four or eight antennas, depending on how you interpret it. Um, but it only uses linear uh, processing and it doesn't really divide time and frequency. It just decides it has channels, but it doesn't um, create resource blocks. It's a contention protocol. Um, and uh, in fact, many will argue that it's not even multi-user because the acknowledgments that are required are coming in the uplink direction, which is not multi-user in that standard, and so they have to go through an acknowledgment uh, protocol, which means you have to wait for each one of them to come back so you effectively reduced any advantage. 11AX solved that problem, but it remained linear, uh, and it has some resource blocks. So you see this happening. Um, LTE, 5G, 32 antennas, perhaps selected from a larger number. Um, it's kind of semi-multi-user MIMO in both directions, um, but limit on the number of users today is 32. That might be pretty good, but it's only linear again. And the linear precoder choices Aren't, do not come from that matrix factorization. They actually come from a fixed set. It's called a code book that's actually specified. You have to go through the code book and pick one of them that's closest to what you think may be the best thing to use. <coughs> so neither, uh, on top of this, you really yet optimizes the energy distribution, and neither yet uses the nonlinear precoder. Yeah, uh, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, the question I understand is 11 AC. Uh, up to 11 AC standard, or through 11 AC standard, no one has None of the chipset members, from the best of my understanding, has to implement the multi-user mode. That's my understanding, even for AX uh, at this point in time. The hooks are there in the standard. If you read it, it's all there. Now, they don't bring those out to MIBS, which I would like to see them do, because I think that's going to be much better handled by statistical, um, uh, you know, maybe distributed, but over multiple access points and so forth uh, to do that. Uh, now, we are going to more and more antennas. This is a great thing, dimensionality. And we might not have the best si designs of the best uses, but we keep reducing the wavelength and then using more and more antennas. And because of the robustness of the environment, the bandwidths keep going up with time. And so here uh, you'll, I show a 12 by 12 array, the basic ideas. This may be only the size of your hand uh, with, say, millimeter wave uh, systems. Um, and there's an antenna in each one of these squares on the transmit side. There's a, another one on the receive side. Uh, and we try to take advantage of that uh, as best we can. Uh, here's again from Huawei. Um, they're looking at the terahertz band, which is from 100 gigahertz to one terahertz in terms of communications. 
talking about those 2030 data rates, what do you need to do to get there? And this is the array sizes that they're projecting. Okay, all the way up, you see that, that bottom one there is, is four million antennas. Now it's at four te terahertz, so it's gonna be uh, still about a five inch square type of thing that could be um, actually fabricated uh, and used. And running up the number of antennas uh, to a larger number gives you more degrees of freedom, ability uh, to uh, keep increasing data rates. So dimensions are increasing. More spectrum, minimum weight and beyond, terahertz band. Some is going to be unlicensed. More antennas in 3D. Smaller and smaller spatial separation. So we can do this. Other dimensions, uh, again, uh, I say the OAM stuff tongue in cheek, but managing it all, this is gonna be a mess. Different systems, different dimensions. So how do we do that? Uh, central or distributed? Maybe with a little bit of coordination. So let's talk uh, a little briefly here about Wi-Fi. Uh, this is from my company experience. We actually manage um, internet access connections and Wi-Fi is, is part of that. Uh, and basically, we have these uh, definitions of when the, the connection is uh, stable or unstable. Uh, and we take a, a fraction of that for, I'm showing here the instability. This means there, there's too many packet errors or it's likely to be an unhappy customer. Fiber is the best medium, but it doesn't always provide um, great connectivity. So it's nothing is, it comes free, so to speak. Cable, about 20%. Uh, speeds are less on average. These are actual throughputs, so not what they advertise uh, in terms of connection speed, but the actual throughput that was measured. Different DSLs, different flavors, shorter copper. Uh, these are the speeds. Now, if you start managing these systems, you can see that factor of two or factor of three on your worst con connections uh, improving. Wi-Fi is the worst, okay? At least half the connections are really bad. And you can get that down, not as good as maybe some of the, the wired connections, and typical speeds are much less than the advertised speeds uh, there as well. Um, 4G, 5G, I really don't know. I, I believe it's less bad than Wi-Fi, um, and uh, I'm only guessing uh, here, but I think it's, it's a better design. It, it does have this management with resource blocks, so should uh, have better performance. Question and comment uh, on Wi-Fi. Uh, do you have any data on uh, you know, single AP, big AP, you know, blasting versus these new mesh-based Wi-Fi's coming into the home. Yeah, it's, Whether it, they solve stability issues or there, do you notice difference? I'll send you the slides. I, I have some in the backup, so that's a good question. But yeah, it's a big problem. The, the, um, more often than not, the, the various companies who are advertising mesh and that we've seen there, we have to work with their equipment and that, and they're causing more problems than they're solving uh, because of the, they're colliding w with each other. And the other one is, uh, I, you know, th this is just a comment. I suspect that 4G, mm -hmm. especially in emerging countries like India and so on, just the sheer density, uh, you know, is capex spending not increasing the number of base stations, and with the limited spectrum they have, I suspect that mm -hmm. as the subscriber mm -hmm. growth is increasing, they probably are seeing a tremendous. I, th I think you're probably space. right, but I don't have any data from yeah. India, so that's I, that's I can't comment. Yeah. Anecdotal evidence. Okay. <laughs> um, so hang, hang on, I'm going the wrong way here. Um, so what, what's kind of going on here? Well, there are different types of problems you can see in Wi-Fi. One is just coverage. Uh, the signal's not getting there. Uh, and then there's crosstalk, the different access points um, interfering with one another, at least over part of their, their topological or geographical coverage. And then there's the issue of who controls, what channel they use and select, and so forth. Um, this is sometimes called the co cocktail party problem. You get the basic idea, so many people in a cocktail party, some are talking part of the room, and it's kind of noisy, so they speak up, um, and ask them to speak louder, so they talk louder, and then this one needs to go even louder, and pretty soon nobody communicates. Uh, now, as you start to get more and more people in the room, it gets harder to solve uh, this problem. It gets too loud, uh, but the solution is to talk actually at a low volume level in a small group, and if everybody does that, <coughs> there's a tremendous improvement even though they're all using the same frequency spectrum to speak. And this is kind of the nonlinear thing that I was talking about earlier. Um, so, and, and to your point, and this is not even the mesh thing, which is worse, 
But if you look at a lot of the Wi-Fi boxes and chips, what they do today is they try to transmit at a very high speed, um, which means they use very wide bandwidths, multiple channels combined together at the highest possible power level, and the, um, they exacerbate problems like this. Um, so the solutions to these problems are fairly known in information theory. Here's a couple of, rate, uh, a couple of users, and there's um, what's called a rate region, which defines what types of pairs of rates are achievable, and they're not necessarily um, independent. If they were independent, that occurs in some situations. You get a, a rectangle for the region, and you can kind of solve each user's problem independently. Uh, but if they are dependent, if there's crosstalk between the systems, you'll see this more curved type of, of region. Uh, and it happens with Wi-Fi and all con co collision protocols, basically. Uh, and this also help, happens with multi-user MIMO big time. Uh, and uh, again, this multi-user diversity uh, does not apply uh, there. Here's some examples. Now, this is pretty simple stuff. Uh, there's some machine learning that's going on and deciding which uh, channels to use for Wi-Fi. Here's a speed distribution. These are 802.11. I believe it was AC systems. Uh, these are actual throughputs, and basically green is good, red is bad here. And before um, you go to the cloud-based optimization of the channels and use, um, the, um, the speeds look pretty bad. There's about 21% that are at risk there, or below 5 megabits, which can uh, aggravate the consumer user, and that reduces by more than a factor uh, of two. Uh, and these are the users that are going to create all the problems. Uh, they're going to be complaining, they're going to be unhappy. There are those of you who have the hands up possibly that your internet wasn't working and maybe you switched and used something else at that point. That costs everyone in the chain, the application provider, the service provider money uh, when that happens. So one of the things you want to be able to do, this is a question earlier about stability, um, is to be able to correlate and have good um, met metrics for saying when the connection is not going to have any problems and when it's going to have problems. You can think of that as unstable and stable kind of a red, yellow, green, red being bad. And basically, this can be learned uh, from the networks. And you can see here from these data across many millions of users here, the, uh, the Wi-Fi problems, uh, when they're marked as unstable connections, again, these combinations we create, is about a 16% chance, or that means 16% of the users are going to call and complain that month. And if it's in the green category, only a couple of percent, OK? And that costs money to whoever is providing the Wi-Fi service or the Internet ser service. So uh, how do you get that? Well, you can do a machine learning type of system that actually uh, takes a lot of inputs, the time, the user or device, the application running, the throughput, the place, uh, the network that's on, the access network uh, conditions, and then try to train that. That should be a, a yellow Y there. It didn't come up in the right color here on the screen. Uh, but, um, you basically use the call um, indicators, and then you begin to learn this, and then you can fly without the training data later, and you can take advantage uh, uh, of that to try to actually identify not only a green, yellow, or red, but actually what the specific problem is. Uh, here's some indication on the green, yellow, red for different types of problems. Interference is crosstalk. Coverage is just the signal doesn't get there. Uh, what percentage of the customer have it, and noise is some kind of interference that's not another Wi-Fi, but some other type of noise that happens to occupy the band. You can see the fraction of red there is pretty significant in all three of these areas. Okay, so you have those analytics. Now you'd like to optimize. So optimization can take a couple of paths. One is you simply automatically try to tune the parameters, the resource use, um, or you may have to make a manual uh, intervention of some type, but at least you can tell from what's going on. Now, when you get into multi-user systems, it gets pretty interesting. There are three basic types of multi-user channels. There's a so-called multiple access channel, which means the transmitters are in different places, but the receiver can coordinate all of the received signals uh, to try to guess or estimate what each of the transmitted users is sending. And there's a matrix H, and you would partition it accordingly. Uh, to that. This is a corresponding dual of that, which is the broadcast problem, which is um, all of the transmitters are together, but the receivers are in different places, so they can't coordinate uh, on that side. And then the third type is the interference channel, where there's no coordination on either side. Okay, so that's, that's the hardest uh, problem to solve. Um, 
Any other situation multi-user you can basically show as a combination of these three basic structures. Uh, and uh, also the capacity rate regions are known for all of these, but it can really take a lot of computation to compute. So, uh, and uh, I put in the little QR diagram that I didn't have earlier for the multiple access with the decisions instead of, but this is a nonlinear thing and it goes in the receiver instead of in the transmitter. So let's look at multiple access, just a simple channel, couple of users, different gains, some noise added. Um, and uh, what happens is um, they, in the simplest viewpoint, one looks like noise to the other. However, if you were to decide one of those signals, you could then uh, use it before you decided the second one. If you knew what the channel looked like, you could reproduce that and then subtract it out. So you cancel it and get a free ride if you will, for the second signal. Or you could reverse the order. There's a priority um, issue that starts to show up. Which one's more important? Which one? Because obviously the guy who gets a free ride is going to have a higher data rate. Uh, so um, it's basically a successive approximation approach. Now you can take this a little further with more users. Here's the idea. Uh, one user uh, goes first. He takes a penalty for all the others as noise. Once he's estimated, remove him. Second user doesn't have him as noise anymore. And the last user uh, has a free ride again in the system. Uh, now, it turns out that you can do this over the dimensions, over frequency, over space, and so forth, do this. Uh, and you can begin to show what the rate regions look like for each one of these dimensions. They're pentagons. And if you take the union of all those pentagons, you'll be able to draw the rate region uh, for the multiple access channel, okay? And there's a rate sum, which is basically do a, a minus 45 degree line there, wherever it hits a tangent, that's the maximum rate sum that you can achieve. The broadcast channel basically has to share the energy amongst all the users, but is otherwise kind of similar. It has one of the users has to take a penalty from the other as noise, and then they both have to share the transmit energy. The one that doesn't, that doesn't have to take a penalty from the other user, I call the non-degraded user of the channel. And the one that does is the degraded uh, user. So this is a little bit more general, uh, there's a little generalization of what are called degraded broadcast channels and that you can split any channel into the non-degraded and the degraded uh, portions and every, every channel will decompose accordingly. And then you can again um, draw rate regions uh, from different orders of the users and different combinations uh, over time or over the dimensions uh, fractionally. Now this is a pretty complicated chart. Here's my channel in the middle. But basically you can take any channel, put one of these nonlinear structures on for multiple users. There's non-degraded users. They get to, to transmit as if um, none of the other users, the degraded users were present. And then there's one user in that set that gets a complete free ride. Um, and they get certain <coughs> types of corresponding receivers that are in different places. And then these degraded users, these are going to be the Internet of Things users, in my opinion, in the future. They're riding on top of the same dimensions at smaller levels, and they're all sharing the transmit power. And indeed, you can separately decode each one of those as well. Um, so this is, this is the optimum structure <coughs> that you would need for uh, management. Interference channel, if you do that with no coordination, it's very, very hard to, to, to compute this, this region. It basically involves unions, intersections, and an exhausted application of all the allowed spectral types to all the users. You go through that an infinite amount of computation, you come out with the re region. And while you can compute the solutions, <coughs> it's still going to involve a prioritization of the users. Um, so it may be better to learn the user behaviors. So you remember we had this training system before to try to figure out what the, the quality of service was, here's a controller that's now using power spectrum, code uh, parameters, priority, antennas, if you will, to that network and trying to decide uh, which user uh, uh, gets which dimensions or which use patterns. And again, this is an adaptive learning problem. And what you can find, a simple version of this would give you a state machine where red states are bad here, yellow are kind of between and green are good uh, states. And what happens is you're floating around this state machine depending on what's happening in a given point in time, what you've measured, what you've learned, and you may shift. And in each of these states, there's a different allocation of energy and use to the dimensions uh, in the system. 
And so you can improve uh, this way through learning methods. So um, globally, about 20% of unmanaged fixed label connections are, are unstable each month. Uh, they can improve through this type of management. And what um, I, I have here is some actually really nice, is that where they actually went out and to consumers and say, did you experience an improvement? Did you actually notice that uh, when, when this type of learning was going on? Over half the customers actually said that. That's like golden to a service provider. To, to, that's worth a fortune to them to be able to do that. And then here's the level of improvement. Different. You can't read the slide there so much, but it's just different countries in the world uh, uh, depending on how aggressive they are with their internet. Now, if we put on top of this multipath TCP type of systems, try to combine Wi-Fi, maybe LTE, other uh, systems, um, and they both have maybe a 20% chance of a bad connection, the chances that they're both bad is 4%. Uh, for that if they're independent. And so this is another thing that can be taken advantage of in the, uh, uh, in the optimization of connections. Okay, but suppose one path costs more than the other, um, that would be factored into to doing this. Uh, here's an example, it gets better with time as basically what's going on the horizontal, hor the vertical axis I should say is basically level of goodness, success percentage, um, which is um, the blue line there. The upper line is, is basically an indication of how many systems were trained. Um, and you begin to see the improvement going up and it's a little hard to see on the vertical axis, but it's going from about 75% to 85% um, happy uh, customers after this. It amounts to about one action per day uh, on a Wi-Fi connection uh, to do that. Um, some connections need more than that, some need less. Um, but you can, you can learn and improve. Uh, and these are doing very simple things. They're not the, all the multi-user, nonlinear pre-code or other things. These, these are just what you can do with systems in the field today. And then um, here is just a simple example of the linear and nonlinear. I actually used a pretty wideband system here. So the data rates are high, uh, but what you see here, the increasing attenuation uh, of the link, what happens is the difference between linear and nonlinear uh, starts to to diminish, but at reasonable uh, levels uh, with 20 users here, there is a big advantage uh, to that nonlinear system. So then I go back to one of the original slides I had with the distributed system and where we had the, um, the physical layer connections, we don't really have those anymore. There's overlap, there's resource use uh, instead of the data plane that we saw with routers. And instead of having the control plane, we really have the access points or mesh points, if you will, but if they can talk to each other a little bit, as they can, um, it's not really the routing tables, but it's the information they're seeing about what they're doing, and if you were able, in, from the cloud, to apply some of the multi-user algorithms, you could actually improve the system. Um, and some of the data you'd want to collect would be the gains of the channel, the users, not uses, uh, their signal-to-noise ratios, transit power packet errors, MCS is the modulation co coding system that was used, the bands, the channels, and what time were they used. If you have multiple antennas, you may want the array coefficients, whether linear or nonlinear was used, spatial uh, stream data, of course, at times, and the capabilities of that device to assign the dimensions. Not all devices will allow you to do that. Uh, other data, you'd want to know the device types, the applications running, the user number. I'm not saying they're, pr they're private information, but just some kind of identifier uh, for different users. And the controls are basically the dimensional resource blocks, preferred schedules, priorities, codes, bands, uh, frequencies that can be tuned. Now this would represent a demonstrable improvement, in my opinion, uh, if all of this data and controls were available in Wi-Fi today. It's kind of a super self-optimizing network. And uh, uh, so it would lead to a big improvement. And so I'm saying as much as left today, both LTE and Wi-Fi in terms of resource management, LTE is somewhat better, but not close to optimum. Wi-Fi is beginning to offer some of the resource management, not as good as LTE, but there's still a long ways to go. Some combination of local management and cross-network sharing may improve. Uh, modem and chip vendors, this is a little frustrating because a lot of them want to do everything themselves inside the, the, the components, but really this is best done 
um, in the cloud uh, where sharing can occur. Uh, the Wi-Fi is unlicensed and it's controlled in the ends of the network, kind of like the IP system earlier. Uh, and the router tables kind of give way to the physical data, the uses, and the schedules. And if you share that around yourself in a good way and take optimizing uh, decisions, uh, it may well be that the distributed and controlled Wi-Fi uh, is really the network that dominates in the future. And if you're a service provider, you might want to want to hear that, or maybe you do. You want to take advantage of it. Uh, and so, once I get back to my original title, Y five G, uh, you could take that as Y five G W H Y, or you take it as Y five becoming five G. However, you'd like to take it. But the projection is, while it's a mess and maybe not designed as well, it's kind of free and it puts control in the hands of the innovators, uh, and that may be. Uh, the, the future path that, that, that actually happens while we're uh, busy uh, designing other types of well-designed uh, uh, wireless systems. So thank you very much for your time uh, today. Thank you, John, for yes, a wonderful uh, tour de force of <laughs> uh, everything from antennas to information <laughs> theory, physical layers, all the way through the systems to actual you know, measurements and machine learning and, <laughs> you know, tuning the systems in practice. So, uh, questions, please. Any questions? I'm having a little trouble seeing, uh, hearing the bright light in my eyes, but, yeah, there, there's one there. Why do you make the nature of those things that the, even with the current approach, they run Well, the, no, the NOMA, I think, is a very broad category, but the NO is non-orthogonal. So what's implied there is that the users are sharing some of the dimensions uh, for access. And the general theory would imply that that's the right direction to go. Now, whether the specific NOMA approaches that are being proposed in the industry actually do that or not is a separate, separate question. It, I, I, it, from what I can see in both Wi-Fi and LTE, there was a point in time where this multi-user diversity is quoted. If you go back in, in time and look at it, and this is the reason they do things like linear precoders uh, and design the systems the way they've designed them. Those are also easier to implement, but it's based on this multi-user diversity concept. And I could, I could give you an example here. Let's, let's suppose we had a room full of users where all, where all everyone here has a device and we're trying to uh, use the system. And we assume that you're all moving around the room, and over time you'll be in every chair in this room. And, and, and if you do that, it's kind of an ergodic assumption with time. At any one point in time, okay, you will be able to pick from the set of users a set where the linear precoder is optimum. Okay? And then, and then at another point in time, there's another set of users that will be optimum. But that's not really what happens. You're all sitting in the same place. You're not moving all around and plopping a difference. So that averaging goes away. And if you're all set in a certain position, it is what it is. It's whatever the channel is. And you can get two or three times the data rate if that's really what's happening. So it's only when you have this robust you know, kind of placement of all the devices in time and frequency that the multi-user diversity assumptions take place. And, and, and it's not just a lot of users. It's that they're at every place and every point in time, it's at some instance of dimensional use, uh, and that's just not true. Uh, the sensors, the devices are going to be in different, especially if it's in, inside a room like this, they're going to be relatively stationary. And so that assumption doesn't, doesn't apply. And so you can easily find channels where you get a much higher data rate uh, if you use the nonlinear system, but if you do use the multi multi-user diversity, if you follow the assumptions of that, it turns out that the linear system is presumed optimum. So there's nothing wrong with the theory. It's just the assumptions that went into that theory don't apply, uh, but somehow that got missed in the process and some of the standards groups just used it. So, well, that's an easier transmitter. Let's go with that uh, at that point and use the, the theory to do that. But I, I don't think it applies. And, and just to add to, add to this, John, one more thing you have, you know, in, in practice, you may just find that from the point of view of multi-user, multi uh, MIMO, uh, uh, you know, the 
the grouping that you want to do uh, may not make sense at a higher level because some guys may one of them may want to just transmit a little text message mm -hmm. while another one may be wanting to be doing you know video streaming so all these disparate higher level messages may not make act well while well it may make sense to group them at a physical layer from an application point of view they may not make sense to and that's another you know I dimension which we don't even th talk about yes yeah, so, so that would simply amplify the point amplify further the but point. i didn't include that in the analysis you're correct Okay, any, any other questions here? Okay, well, thank you very much. I uh, enjoyed uh, speaking to you today.